morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad you're here. I think fall is finally here. Praise God. My favorite season of the year. Sweatshirt weather, long sleeve weather. Absolutely love it. Uh, we're glad, glad to see you today. Glad that we have the opportunity for us to worship together. And I always want to kind of keep this before us because I think we're all home folk this second service. I always want to kind of keep this before us, and that is the kind of church that God has called us to be, the kind of community for Christ that he's called us to be. And that is the kind that encourages folks that regardless of what their background is, maybe they're a different denominational background, or maybe they haven't been to church in a long time, or, or maybe they've been walking with the Lord faithfully for years. It doesn't make any difference. We want folks to know that there's a place for them here at Aviano Baptist. We can come together, we can connect as a church community so we can help each other grow in our relationship with Christ. So when that day comes, when he sends us on, whether he just sends us out into the community here or in the next place he's got for us to go, that we're a little bit further in our walk with Christ than we were when we arrived. That's what we strive to be about as a church. I do hope that if you have any prayer requests that uh, you have trying to pull this thing out so my little my little prop <laughs> if you have any prayer requests any way we can be ministering to you any way we can pray be praying for you or your family i do hope that you you know that we can share those with us there are slips back there i had them up on the baptistry but i moved them to the back of the room because that makes more sense they're back there by the offering plate in the back so feel free to grab one of those right on there if there's any way we can be praying for you or any way we can minister to you and your family let me draw your attention to a couple of announcements, and really these are things that are so much not in the announcement email for today. Um, so just a reminder, you can get the weekly announcements, since we're not doing bulletins, um, the weekly announcements are available in the YouVersion Bible app. You'll find our service as an event in there in YouVersion, um, and then just open it up and you'll see the announcements there. They also come out as a weekly email, and we share the link on the Facebook page, and then on Mondays we share that on to the WhatsApp group, so you can find it in any one of those places. But let me just mention a few things. First of all, the masks and the COVID situation, as, as we talked about, I think last week, um, I do have to ask that everyone has their masks up at all times while we're in the service. That's the latest COVID decree that came out on the 13th. Um, we, I did read a news story this morning that the prime minister is going to make another, have a press conference tonight, make another announcement about some more decrees and guidelines and stuff. So I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how or if we're praying that doesn't affect our ability to have church together. Whatever that looks like, we'll post it up on the Facebook page. You'll see it on the base app as well, I'm sure. But we'll post it on the Facebook page, particularly if there are any impacts to what we can do um, in our church service. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I do want to thank everyone who came out for the workday yesterday. We had another workday yesterday. You see you guys are sitting by the newly opened window. That window has not been, there's not been light coming in that window in, I don't know, maybe 10 years. And now suddenly we pulled the air conditioner out of that window yesterday. Um, yeah, didn't even notice it, right? But it's one of those things, that you, the room just looks so much different over there. But I want to thank everybody who came out for the workday yesterday. We had about 15 people here yesterday. And for every workday, we've had a great group crew come out for all of them. And we got a whole lot of stuff done, stuff packed up and organized and sorted through, stuff like that. If you, when you look in the announcements, you'll notice there are two more work days on, this, on the calendar. I think we'll, we may have to have one in addition to that, but we'll see what that looks like. So there's one on the 7th of November, so if you can join us for that. My hope is we're going to be able to move stuff to the new building on the 7th. So here's the incentive. If you haven't seen the new building yet, here's a spoiler alert. Come on the 7th to, work, to the work day, and you can come with us and see the new building before we formally, formally move into it. But then we're having another one on the 15th. Now, the 15th will be our last live service in this building, COVID, COVID if assume, assuming that allows us to do it. But it will be our last live service in this building. It will be the 15th. We're going to have a time during the service where we're celebrating all the, some of the great things that God has done in this place over the last 40-plus years. We're going to have a time of prayer for the future. And then we're asking as many people as possible to stick around after the service. I'll put up a sign-up sheet because we'll feed you first. And then we've got to tear this place apart. With all these ceiling fans got to come down. All this AV equipment's got to come out. This stage has got to come out. So we're going to have a, a tear the church apart party after the service on the 15th. So I hope you can join us for that. And put that on your calendar so you can stick around um, after the service on the 15th. I've got a note written down here, and I have no idea what in the world it says. So... We stare at it awkwardly for another minute and hope that maybe it comes to me. But anyway, it's not coming to me, so I don't know what it says. If, if I remember it, then I'll, I'll mention it to you later. Um, today is the last Sunday. We are taking 
pastor search committee nominations. So if you have not nominated folks to serve on the pastor search committee yet, um, the, the criteria for that is in the announcements. And so there are slips back there by the offering plate. You can also send them in via email, secretary at avianobaptist.church or um, Facebook message them to Amanda Serta. That's our church secretary. You can send them in e either way, but we're, today's the last day we're collecting them and then we'll tally them up and we'll post the names that'll be a part of the pastor search committee um, sometime this week. All right, we're glad you're here today. We're glad we have this opportunity to worship together. So let's, let's stand as we sing and, and spend some time praising our Lord this morning. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> nice to see everybody here. Um, <clears throat> hopefully this will continue to happen. You know, like Pastor Barry was saying, it seems like Groundhog Day, you know, things are starting <laughs> over again, but hopefully Groundhog they don't. Year. Yeah, Groundhog Year, right? Um, <clears throat> but... Glad to see everybody here. So um, before we get started, if you could just bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for the ability that we have to come together and meet uh, and to learn about your word and to worship you. We pray, Lord, that you please prepare our hearts, Lord, through this worship and just give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand your word, Lord. We pray that you speak through Pastor Barry that you help us just, <clears throat> that you help him to convey uh, the word that you have provided for us today, that you just help us to block out all distractions, Lord. Help us just to seek after you, to seek your word, to put you first, to trust in your future grace, Lord God, which we need so desperately, Lord, every day. Um, and we love you and we praise you, Lord. We pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
So I don't know if you noticed, there's, well, I'm sure you did, there's only two of us. Another side effect of <coughs> the COVID, not because people are sick, but because of restrictions. Um, so that's partially why I was talking about earlier. Hopefully we can um, continue to meet, continue to have a band and do all those things that make church great. Um, <coughs> So between this song and then the song after, um, I find myself being reminded a lot of my personal inadequacy, <coughs> just my sinfulness before God and how much I really need his work to be done in me, how much I need him just to, his reckless love and his never-ending, just constant searching for me and seeking me out because uh, nothing that I do, nothing that we do, will make us worthy, right? That's the whole point of, of Jesus' death and resurrection, is that <coughs> our, our good works, going to church, reading the Bible, whatever it is that you think helps you check that box or make the mark, like, it's never good enough. And without God's future grace and without being able to live in that, uh, we, we don't have any, we have no hope. Um, without Christ, and so, um, yeah, I just, every time I play these songs, <coughs> I just think about that for myself, but, so, when you're singing these songs, just si think of the words, and, and let them kind of just wash over you, and think about how they apply to you, you know, don't just, s obviously, I love to hear you guys sing, but don't just sing it to sing it, really, really sing it as, as praise and worship mm -hmm. to the Lord, because that's what, that's what we're doing, you know, we're not just here to put on a show, we're not talented enough for that. <laughs> the whole point is to, to bring glory to God. So. <clears throat>
be seated. Thank you, as always, praise team. It's a great reminder that the rock that we can build our lives on won't be moved, won't be shaken no matter what is happening. We built our lives on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Well, take out your Bible or open up the Bible app on your device. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where we are today. We're making our way uh, methodically these last several weeks through the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we are today. And just as a remi reminder, I'm calling this series Counterculture. Because as Paul wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica, he's, he's writing to a young church, a church of young believers, and he's encouraging them to live for Christ in the world that rejects him. And if we look around, there's no, no surprise, that's not news to any of us, that the world that we live in, the culture that we live in, does not embrace the message of the gospel. In fact, at times, outright rejects Christ. And yet we're called to live for him. We're called to live very counter culturally. That was the message, one of the messages Paul had for the church in Thessalonica. It's a message, I think, a very relevant message that he has for us today. I am what has come to be called, I know, I think it's great there's a title for this now, and it sounds almost, you know, almost respectable, but I, I am what has come to, come to be called a verbal processor. What that really means is I talk to myself all the time. I have to think out loud. That's what it means. I, every, every thought, I really can't do anything with it until a thought gets from here and gets out here. Then I can hear it. Then I can play with it. And I know, see, I also like the bicycle, and that's great thinking time. That's great just muttering to myself time. And so I can imagine the people around town are wondering, who's Crazy Charlie over here on the bicycle, who's muttering to himself constantly as he's riding through the city of Aviano. But that, I, can't, I just can't work with my thoughts when they're stuck here. I got to get them out. I got to get them out here where I can play with them, where now that I hear them, now that they're real. And I want us to talk this morning about not what it means to think out loud, but what it means to love out loud. How it is that we can take the love of God, that we can experience through a relationship with Jesus Christ, and how He wants us to take His love from in here and bring it out here in a way that is tangible and real and has an impact on the culture around us. So take your Bibles, you've got them open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read the first 12 verses, you just follow along. He says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ, that as you receive from us instructions as to how, to, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you. For the Lord has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives us his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you don't need anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God how to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, and to attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you once again as we open your word. And as we're challenged by this letter that you inspired Paul to write so many, many years ago. And Lord, what an amazing thing it is as we come to your word even today, some 2,000 years later, and we realize it's just as relevant, just as practical, just as applicable today as it was then. And so, Lord, as you speak to our hearts today, you have inhabited the praise of your people. You will continue to do that as we praise you now by spending time in your word. Lord, as you speak to our hearts, would you help us to be convicted? Help us to be responsive to you, that we, we could be challenged in this area of how to live out loud in this community, that we can make your name great. Would you speak to us in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And here's the big idea this morning. Again, if you're new with us, this is kind of the main thought of the passage, I think, these verses that Paul wrote. And here's sort of his main thought, his big idea. And he's describing for them and describing for us how we can please God, how we can glorify Him through our lives. Everybody, in some way, is trying to please someone. And as we, as we go through our days of this life, there's, there's, there's some driving force in us where we're trying to please someone. And for some people, that's their boss, right? Their, their work center. They, they, that's what they live for. Everything they do is, is just completely consumed by this idea of pleasing their boss or, or getting ahead in the work center. For some people, that's who they're striving to please. For some, it's a spouse or a significant other. That's the one thing that dominates our, our thoughts, dominates our actions, is, is the desire to, to please those that we're in a relationship with. Many times in our society, in our sinful lives, in our sinful hearts, the, the one that we are trying to please the most is ourselves. We go through our lives, this complete, that's the focus of everything, is pleasing me. But Paul's message to them, I believe, and his message to us is that as believers, our priority ought to be a little bit higher focus. Our main priority in this life is to what does it take to please God? What does it take through the course of our lives to put a smile on God's face? What does it take to please Him, and how can we live our lives in a way that glorifies Him? That other people see His love through us in a way that, it, that is drawing to them. That we're, we're making God great, magnifying Him in our lives. And that's the challenge that Paul gives to the church then. That's, I believe, the challenge he's got for us today. And he starts talking about, I, I encourage you, I exhort you to walk. That's what he talks about in verse 1. Paul makes a lot of this analogy through a lot of his writings. He makes a lot of this analogy of walking. And he's not talking about how we physically walk. He's talking about how we live our lives. And so I want us to see this morning how in sort of three areas, three sort of buckets in our lives, how he's encouraging them and encouraging us to walk in a way, live our lives in a way that pleases God and glorifies him in our lives. Kids, here's the key words for this morning. So if you are taking notes, kids, you can jot these words down. The key words, holiness, love, and humility. And as I go throughout the course of the message this morning, you jot those words down, and every time I say one of them, you can just make a little hash mark on the page next to those words, uh, or you can just reach over and squeeze mom or dad's hands. If you adults want to write those words down too, that's okay. You can use those words as well, um, but then, then you kids can follow along in the message and just jot those words down. So I'll give them a second to write those down. And Paul has these challenges for us because the, the ultimate goal that Christ wants to perform in our lives, and not, not only just to save us and so that we can spend eternity with him, but so that he can use us in this world to be messengers, to be his sounding piece, to be his mouthpiece in this world. And we do that through how we walk, how we live our lives. He want, people need to see in us a life that is transformed by Christ. And so I think they're written down. We're good. All right. So the first thing that Paul talks about, encouragement to them, how to walk in a way that pleases God, glorifies them, glorifies him in our lives is to walk in holiness. Look there again at verse number one. He says, we request, we exhort you about how you ought to walk and please God just as you do and that you excel still more. Now, I've said, this, I've said this several times, that if God saw to it to inspire one of these biblical authors to say something once, it's something he wants us to know. But when he inspires them to repeat it, then it's something that we really need to step back and say, I need to pay attention to that. And that phrase, excel still more, Paul uses it twice. He uses it here in verse 1 and then down in verse 10. And he's encouraging us to never get to the point where we're, where we're marking time. Never get to the point where we're satisfied with where we are in Christ. But there's this constant pursuit of holiness. Always pursuing more. Always chasing after it. To excel still more. He says, you're currently doing this. Good. Do it some more. He's, he's pushing them and encouraging them to constantly be pursuing holiness. Now, we pursue holiness in our lives. That, that doesn't mean that, that we should look at other people and look how much further along we are than them. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, I can think of ten people that, that, are, that are behind me in their walk with Christ. That's not what the pursuit of holiness does for us. For us to look at other people and to compare ourselves to them. 
But a constant pursuit of holiness makes, makes our eyes look up a little bit higher. To constantly look and see how far we have yet to go. God has done some amazing things in your life. I know He has. He's brought you along an incredible distance in your walk with Him, but there's still so far to go. And the closer we get to Christ, the more we realize just how far away from Him we actually are. And the pursuit of holiness, this excels still more, drives us ever more to always have this sort of holy discontent to where we are in our walk with Christ, to never be satisfied. And he fleshes it out a little bit, verses 3 through 6. Kind of what does this look like? Now, I, don't know if, I don't know if you're like this, but i like, I got to see things. I'm a visual learner. i got to see what does that look like. Don't give me a concept. That's too vague and fuzzy and squishy. Give me, give me an example. What does that really look like? He fleshes it out a little bit, verses 3 through 6. And he says there in verse 3, he said, This is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. And, and he talks about these four specific things, but this is not like an all-inclusive list. Well, if I go down and I check those four things, then I'm good. Then I am pursuing holiness. I've got everything all figured out in my walk with Christ. If you ever get to the point where you've got everything figured out in your walk with Christ, come give me the clue, because I haven't figured it all out yet. But it's not, he's not giving us an all-inclusive list. Just check these four things. I think there's a principle at stake here, that holiness impacts everything. We don't have aspects of our lives that I have my Sunday morning self and then my Monday through Saturday self. I'll give God this one hour on Sunday when I'm here. I'll pursue holiness as much as I can in this one hour, but the rest of my time is for me. And there's no intersection, but we don't have those, that separation in our lives. As we pursue holiness, it seeps into every corner, every little nook and cranny of our lives. That's, that's his, I think, his intent there. That holiness impacts everything. Holiness impacts what we do with our bodies. He specifically calls out this issue of sexual immorality. Immorality was a, a way of life in the Roman Empire. They were really good at it. There were a lot of things Roman, the Roman Empire was really good at. Immorality was something they were really good at. It was a, an integral part of their culture. It was a way of life. Look around today. 21st century. It is a way of life now. It is something that's woven into our culture. Immorality is. And he says, abstain from, cut out, avoid those things that God calls sinful, things that we could do with our bodies. And as you know, there is a, a large-scale effort in, in society today to redefine sin, to redefine things that we would like to do with our bodies, but God calls them sinful. Society's trying to redefine all of that, what is sinful, what is not. And he says, abstain from those things, cut them out. Let holiness impact what you do with your bodies. And there are many people in today's society struggling with areas of sexual immorality, whether it's pornography or homosexuality or sex outside of marriage. Many people struggling with those areas. I mentioned that the last, last week, it's in the announcements, and it will be for the next several weeks, we're starting this ministry called Celebrate Recovery. And this is a great place for folks that are struggling. Maybe you're struggling with one of these areas. It's a great place for folks that are struggling with some, some of these areas to get in and get among believers and open up the Word of God and really experience the freedom and the victory that He has for us. I encourage you, if you're struggling with one of these areas, to get involved in that. And then he talks about possessing your own vessel in honor. Now, that's, that's a phrase that I can guarantee you probably don't use in your normal conversation. I want to possess my own vessel in honor. But here's what he's talking about. He's talking about being in control of yourself. Self-control, that's what he's talking about. Living in a way that is honorable. He's talking about that strength, that, that inner strength, living in the strength of the Holy Spirit. Part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. and Living in a way that people would look at your life and mine and they'll say, that's honorable. That is a life that is worth emulating. And he says, possess your own vessel. And let holiness affect that area. And then in verse 5, he said, look, look around. The Gentiles live in lustful passion. Don't live like them. In other words, what's in your heart? See, that's where lust begins. It begins right down here. What is in your heart? He said, what's in your heart? 
Holiness gives God control of what's in our hearts. And he encourages us not just to, to let it impact what we do out here, how we behave, what we do with our bodies, but what is in here. Let holiness impact that. And then he says, let no man transgress or defraud his brother. How do you interact with others? As we go through this life, we're called, we're challenged to live in a way that holiness impacts everything so people see it. It calls us out as, a, as different in this community as we interact with others, as we live a life that pursues holiness. And he says to walk in holiness because we love God. And we're not trying to earn His love. We're not trying to earn His favor. We're not trying to earn a, a list of gold stars in heaven and say, if I just do all the right things, if I do all those four, and, and I keep the list right, well, then God will love me. We're not trying to earn His love. We pursue holiness because we love Him. It's a consequence of our loving Him and Him loving us. Look at verse 7 and 8. He said, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. In other words, this is the purpose of why we do this, because God has put this calling in our lives. So that he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. If you let society determine what you do with respect to those areas he's talking about, what you do with respect to your body, what you do with respect to your, your strength and your heart and your interactions, if you allow society to determine what you do with those things, you're not rejecting the church. That's not the issue. You're not rejecting man's rules. That's not the issue. You're rejecting God himself. That's what makes these issues, this, this movement in society to redefine morality, that's what makes this such a big deal. Our youngest daughter had asked me several years ago, this is, gosh, this must have been 10 years ago we had this conversation. She said, we're talking about the issue of homosexuality. She said, Dad, as, as believers, why do we care? Why do we care what people do in the privacy of their own home? And I said, I don't care what people do in the privacy of their own home. That's not my issue. That's not my business. But when we as a society tell God that we're going to redefine the rules, what you call sin, we don't care. We're going to pursue this anyway. When we do that, we're rejecting God himself. That's what makes this such a big issue. That's why he calls this out in this list. In John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, I list the specific verses there on the slide. Jesus is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, and he says there in John 14 and John 16 that this is the role of the Holy Spirit. He teaches us truth. He helps us understand and remember truth. Then he convicts our hearts concerning truth. And so when we reject, when we allow society to determine what truth is and what truth is not, we're not just rejecting man's rules, we're rejecting the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said we're rejecting God himself. This is a serious matter. And he's calling us to walk in holiness as a love response to God. Because when we shut him down, when we reject the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit, we're saying, I love the world and I love the world's ways more than I love you, God. And he calls the church and exhorts them, encourages them to walk in holiness. And then the second thing he calls the church, calls us to walk in, is to walk in harmony one with the other. Verse number 9. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, here's that phrase again, to excel still more. He's calling him to live out love among the body of Christ. Now in Greek, there are three main words for love. And if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard this before. This is not brand new information to you. There are three main words for love in Greek. Greek is a much more expressive language than English. In English, we have one word for love. We use it for everything. It's the same word to say I love my wife, to say I love my kids, to say I love pizza, to say I love my car. It's all the same word in English. Greek is a lot more expressive than that. And there are three main words in Greek for love. One, one word is the word eros. That's a physical, sensual kind of love. You never find that word in the New Testament. One is the word phileia. It means a, a deep, deep friendship, a sibling kind of relationship. 
In fact, the word that he uses there in verse 9, love of the brethren, how it's translated in English, Philadelphia, that's the word in Greek. That's the, the name of the city in Pennsylvania, city of brotherly love. It's that word. It means a deep friendship, a brotherly kind of love. And then the other word in Greek that, that is used for love is the word agape. And that really describes the, the love of God, unconditional, unmerited love. And here in verses 7 and 8, verse, or verses 9 and 10, he uses these two words interchangeably. And I think that makes sense. Because for us as believers, we have the love of God in our hearts. We share God as a father. And so we share this kind of love, this brotherly kind of love. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. We share that kind of love with one another. We share that kind of unconditional love with one another. That's what we're called to do as believers, to share that brotherly kind of fa familial sort of love. My brother and I are as different as night and day. We're five years apart. He's five years older than me. And if you met the two of us and didn't know we were related, I don't think that you would ever guess it. We are absolutely different. My brother is loud. He's boisterous. He is an absolute extrovert. When he walks in the room, you cannot not know that my brother is there. I'm the absolute total opposite of that. And I often thought to myself that if my brother and I weren't related, I doubt we'd ever hang out. I just, I just doubt, well, we may have met each other, but I doubt we would hang out together. But here's the thing, I love my brother. I would do anything for this man that I otherwise would not have even hung out with, because that's what family does. That's that familial kind of brotherly love, and he calls us to walk in harmony, because here's the thing, our love for each other is the trademark of Christianity. It's what, it's what identifies us as followers of Christ. Jesus said, John chapter 13, verse 35, he said, by this all men will know. This will be the, the sign that they'll see in you as they look at the body of Christ and, and they see love for this diverse group. They see our love for each other. He said, that's what will call you out as my disciples. That's what will let people know. That's a very countercultural thought. That's why I said, I think I said this last week or the week before, I don't know, I've lost track. COVID has goofed up my complete calendar. I have no idea where we are even in the year, but I said it a week or so ago that you can't say I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You absolutely can't. Those two things don't go together. Jesus said, listen, your love for each other, your love for the church is what calls you out as a disciple of mine. It's the trademark of Christianity. And the more we live like God, the more we love like God. It begins to spill out of our lives. It begins to, to just pour out of us. The ultimate example of God's agape love was Jesus dying on the cross for us. Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, God didn't say you get your act together and then I'll send Jesus for you. You get all your ducks neatly in a row, you start doing all the right things, and then I'll send Jesus for you. But while we were in the depths of our sin, he sent Jesus to die for us. The ultimate example of his agape love for us. And he causes us to love one another and excel still more in that. And here's how he does it. He doesn't open up our head and dump in a bunch of love for each other. This is how he does it. He puts us in situations where we have to love people who don't necessarily love us. You find yourself in those situations in life where people aren't always nice, right? People don't always, we don't always treat each other the way we ought to. And it's very much a reflection of, of our relationship with God. He pours out his love on us. Listen, when we're not even lovable, when we're not loving, and he puts us in situations where we have to practice the love of God when it's hard, when people aren't terribly loving to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, there's the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul is describing what love looks like in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And these are some of the words he uses to describe it. Patient, kind, not jealous, not arrogant, rejoices in truth, bears all things, hopes all things, never gives up. You know what I can't help but to notice about that list? None of those are feelings. Do you notice that? When we talk about love, we think about feelings, this sort of tingly feeling, this warm, fuzzy feeling. None of those words are feelings. How do you know somebody's patient? By the way they act. How do you know somebody's kind? 
by acts of kindness. How do, how do you know any of those things? You know it by their actions. It's not feelings. Those are choices. Every single one of them. And he calls us to walk in harmony, to make the choice every day, to live in a loving way, to pursue that harmonious relationship one to another. That's a billboard for the world that Christ has done something different in our lives. And then the last thing he calls us to walk in is to walk in humility. Look there at verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Now he's not talking about never talking in our lives, to lead a quiet life. And he's not talking about talking real silent. That's not what he's talking about, that we, we'd be quiet that way. He's talking about this quietness of heart, this quietness of spirit, this sense of, of inner peace that enables us in a very real way to realize that Christ is actually all that we need, to be satisfied in him and him alone. The world says, pursue greatness. The world says, build yourself up. The world says, get everything you can get. That's what ambition in the world looks like. And it's amazing to me how things in God's economy flip our understanding complete, completely to the opposite. He says, let your ambitions be the exact opposite of everything the world calls you to do. Let your ambition be to pursue inner peace, inner rest in God. Put your pride aside. Live humbly in a way that, that casts ambition aside and puts it and surrenders it at the feet of God. And humility requires contentment. It requires us to be content with what God has for us in our lives. The writer of Hebrews said this, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. He said, be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That word content in Hebrews chapter 13. It's the same word that Paul quotes God using, telling him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Over in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it's translated sufficient. You remember Paul is, is talking about this thorn that he has in his flesh, some unknown medical issue to us. Now, I, I don't think he explained it to the Corinthians because I think they knew what he was talking about. We don't know, but I think it's on purpose God didn't tell us. We don't need to know. We would get obsessed about that one thing, but I think there's a greater principle there. And the word is translated sufficient there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's translated here as content. Our contentment is in our realization that Christ is sufficient. And that, that takes a great deal of humility for us. To be able to surrender our lives, surrender our plans, surrender what we have in this life, and lay it at the feet of God and realize He is sufficient. When Paul is talking about this, this thorn in his flesh, he says that, that he exhorted God three times to take this thing away. He implored God three times to take it away. And to be content doesn't mean we live in a sense of defeat. It doesn't mean we live in a sense of disconnection to what's going on in our lives. It doesn't mean that we just sort of give up or we don't care what's going on. Paul is begging God, would you take this thing away from me? He cared deeply about what was happening in his life. But God said no. He didn't take it away. And But moving forward, here's what I want us to see. Moving forward in Paul's life, from that moment forward, whatever that medical issue was, whatever that thorn in his flesh was, and whether it was pain or it was some physical limitation, or, or maybe it was some relational issue, we didn't really know, but whatever it was, it was still with Paul. Every moment of every day from that point, probably to the end of his life. But what changed? What enabled Paul to come to the realization to say, I accept the fact that God's grace is sufficient for me, is Paul's reaction to the thorn. The thorn was still there, but Paul's reaction to it was very different. He chose to accept that God's decisions for his life were better than his own. That's contentment. When we get to that place in our lives where we can accept that God's decisions for me are better than my own. And from that point forward, Paul was reminded every time he thought about the thorn, every, every time he was reminded about whatever that was, from that point forward, he was reminded to think about God's goodness. 
Now, can you see the perspective change? How now he sees the he sees his entire life is submitted to to God and to the will of God. That God wanted to do something in Paul's life that was far greater than the short term relief of pain or relief from that situation. That comes when we accept that God, the God behind those decisions is for us. He's in our corner. He's working on our behalf. And we can, we can get to that's contentment. That's the inner peace. That's that quietness of life he calls us to. Humility accepts that. And then humility accepts the, the privilege of being his witnesses, of carrying that message to the world around us. It's not a burden. It's not a task that we're called to do to share our faith. It's a privilege. And humility accepts that it's a privilege to be his witness. Verse 12. He said, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Behave properly is the same word he uses in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. He's talking over there in 1 Corinthians 14 about the conduct in the church. Everything ought to be neat. Everything ought to be orderly. And the emphasis in both places is on the believer's witness to the unsaved. That the things that we do in our lives are drawing people to God or they're pushing Him away. And God's love shed abroad in our hearts is not just so that we love other believers, not just so that we show brotherly love to each other, but so that we'll love unbelievers enough to be a good testimony to them. God's love is the most life-changing thing that you will ever experience in this world. It enables us to walk in holiness. It enables us to walk in harmony. It enables us to walk in humility. But more than that, it enables us to be forgiven, to spend eternity with God in heaven through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask our praise team to come on back up for one final worship song. And I want this last song to not just be a time when we're singing, not just be a time when, when we're going through the, the music of the, of the song, but let this be a time that as the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart this morning, as He continues to speak, that you would be open to what He has to say as we spend these last few moments worshiping. So let's stand together as we sing this last worship song.
spoke to you this morning. If there is a decision that you need to make, uh, if there's something, some way the Lord is dealing with your heart this morning, you need someone to pray with you, you need someone to encourage you, I'm available to do that after the service. Maybe it's to trust in Him for the first time, and if that is the case, you just come down and tell me I need to know Jesus. Or any other matter, I'd be glad to talk with you, put my arm around you, and pray with you. Don't forget on our way out this morning, there are prayer slips there by the, the uh, offering plate in the back. Also, there are nomination forms for the pastor search team, so if you have a major nomination yet, you can do that on your way out this morning. Let me, let me dismiss our time in prayer this morning. Father, thank you once again just for the opportunity for us to gather in this place, to open up your word and be challenged by it. And Lord, we pray as we go out from this place, Father, that you would ever challenge our hearts to excel still more in loving out loud, that we can be your instruments of righteousness and hope to this lost and dying world. Lord, now go with, go with us as we go from this place. We pray in Jesus' name.